so my question is is uh, kind of linking from the opening uh, talk about helping people. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how koan practice serves as this kind of bridge between our meditation and our bodhisattva nature to help all beings. Thank you. Very good question. I believe Kongan practice is one of the most expedient means to realize who we truly are and transcend our own dualistic karma. Why? Because with your dualistic mind, beyond a certain level, you cannot solve the Kongan. So as we meditate, we attain our true nature, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror. Intuition is the direct function of our true nature. It has very little to do with what Westerners believe, okay, about uh, cognitive intelligence, emotional intelligence. They are all there, but they're not the source of your intuition. In fact, they are powered by your intuition. It's very different. So if your intuitive skills develop, then without thinking, you are already complete. You recognize the situation, the relationship, and the function right away. If thoughts are necessary, they appear as tools, but not as the source. How do you know you're progressing? In everyday life, something unexpected, unfamiliar happens, critical or not, and your intuition sparks and there's a perfect or perfect looking solution. I would say the optimal solution. How do you know? The problem does not reappear. That's how you know you solved it, not what you think about it. So Kongan practice is the lab version. You can make any amount of mistakes, you don't get harmed. You can come any amount of times, you can try any amount of times, no problem. But in real life out there, you make one mistake, you do years of cleanup. Huge consequences. So a thousand years after Shakyamuni Buddha, in Tang Dynasty China, or before that slightly, Bodhidharma actually laid down the final groundwork of Zen, or Chan. It had been there centuries before, many centuries before. There's evidence that even in Christ's time, Mahayana was well developed in areas of China. So, Hongan practice came as a necessity because people were so well versed in the sutras. They knew everything the Buddha reportedly had said. So it became an intellectual layer and without sufficient practice or even with sufficient practice, it was not enough to go beyond your own dualistic thinking, therefore your ego, your sense of self. So they had to work something out and that was the paradox because the orthodox didn't work anymore. And the paradox really catapults you to unknown territories with your mind. And as you experience your non-self inside, your usual everyday self becomes more transparent, more transformable, and thus more acceptable by this work. As I got started over 30 years ago with Kongan practice, I remember my first frustration. And it was not the first retreat, otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here. In fact, the first couple of retreats were pretty much, you know, standard. But then, after two, three years, you get to the very thick of it. And then you cannot imagine your reaction to the unsolved mystery of a particular question or case. I saw my own reaction in total horror and disbelief. How can I react with such an amount of frustration and anger just because I didn't solve something 1000 something something years ago in the Tang Dynasty? It's unreal. How can I do that? And then you realize you've had it all the way within yourself. Kongan practice just brought it out. It's very provocative. It's really insightful. And it tears your self-image down to the last bit. If you do this right, very sincerely, it's one of the best ways to change and proceed on the path. Okay. You know, we read about uh, Zen masters in the past and you know, it, they always oftentimes talk about how they have received, I don't know, maybe one koan and then they went up into the mountains and they had this one koan for their whole life and then they got enlightenment. I don't know, Sung Sung uh, Snim had... He was ten, different, he didn't you know, have he a had koan. He had 10 gone. gates, then he, he had, had 13 that. gates. So what has changed? Why do we have, I don't know, 
Why do we do hundreds of koans? What's different today than it Actually, was? Actually, it's very different. I mean, totally and absolutely, except for our Buddha nature, there's almost nothing in common in the way they practiced 100 years ago or the way we are practicing right now, except that we also have a butt and we put it on the mat and that's it. So it was a monastic tradition. They did not have a system for kongans. So they got one kongan and that was supposed to achieve the breakthrough. And they went through all kinds of mental states. But they were up in the mountain. They didn't have to perform every day, all the time. They could allow themselves to be a little crazy, then a little bit enlightened, then happens this, then that. And it was a very, very kind of interesting lifestyle as long as you contributed to the temple and practiced inside. Nobody really bothered you. A couple of decades ago, this teaching came out of the monastic gate, entered the West, a society which is not interested in leaving home, becoming a monk or a nun, mostly. Therefore, in your lay environment, in your everyday life, how do we offer a teaching that is attainable, attractive, yet brings about similar changes as to those who cut down their hair and went up the mountains and some of them never came down? This is about strengthening society, fostering correct family ties, correct relationship, etc. And the individual is not to be denied. It's to be educated and trained. So the system was necessary. Gradation was necessary. You do not get tested for your willpower, first and foremost, just by your compliance. If this was Korea, you wouldn't get any kongans, but you would get the rules ten times over. So Sung San Suim saw how this works with the Western intellect, which is very hungry, very conceptual, sometimes conceited, sometimes just aspirational, ambitious. So he made a system where you go from easier to more and more difficult. That's how training is applied in everyday life, when you have to have uh, your relationship, your work, your car, your dog, whatever. You cannot get out of this for too long. What is really meritorious is if you can achieve that everyday life teaches you in the same way as those monks and nuns are attaining their true nature up on the mountain. That's a lot of work. So the Kongan system was created for us so that we would educate our minds as well as attain our true self from easier to more and more difficult tasks in order that you would have trust in the system, therefore trust in yourself. If we had trained in the way they'd have done, very few people would uh, persevere. If I gave you a level 8 Kongan out of 10, within a couple of months, even the strongest would just disappear. Here, the first interview is designed in such a way that you would rightfully believe that you can do this that your reflection works. And then after the third and fourth and fifth, you get more and more difficult congas. It's very compassionate. Because at first your thinking mind works. It's like relay running. You have four athletes, four times hundred, relay. Okay, Baton, first your intellect. Then runs, hands it over to your emotional intelligence. Then runs another hundred. Then your action power comes, the third. And then comes intuition, the fourth. It's exhilarating. I'm goosebumps when I think about this because if you go through the process, then you have three things. Great question, great faith, great courage. We need all these three. And the great question comes first in form of a kongan or a huadu inside. Great courage is next because you have to go through it. You can't fail. You can't give up. In fact, you only fail if you give up. And great faith comes out of experience, not out of just cognition or belief. So based on experience comes great faith. And these three elements, they are essential in Zen and Kongan practice just embodies that and gives it over to the next generation, which I hope we will.